So thank you everybody for coming to our webinar called A Tale of Two Agencies, Stories of Cross-Departmental Collaboration. Um, before we introduce our great speakers, I'm just gonna walk through a few things. So we've got our agenda. We're gonna start with housekeeping, just sort of how to navigate Zoom during this webinar. I'm sure all of you are pretty much experts by now. And then a little bit about Remix for those who don't really understand um, or know how we play into this story of collaboration. And then we'll hop right in to our guests of honors presentation that is from Metro Transit in the city of Minneapolis and how they collaborate on their Beeline BRT. And then um, David and I, and you'll meet David in a second, we will uh, talk about the newest Remix features. So for participation tips, um, use the Q&A button to ask questions at any point during the webinar. Um, and if you wanna ask your question actually verbally, um, raise your hand to let us know that you would like to be unmuted and comment in person. And then use the chat box to leave comments and share your thoughts. We strongly prefer that you use the Q&A for questions because it's harder for us as the hosts to find your questions in the chat box. And last but not least, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent out to all registrants as usual. So I just wanted to introduce our speakers today. Um, we've got Yasna up first. So Yasna, you wanna say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks Janice. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasna Hadjic Stanek and I'm a transportation planner with City of Minneapolis Public Works. Awesome. And um, Adam, we were having audio issues before, so this is a big gamble. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear <laughs> you. Great. All right. I'm Adam Smith. I'm a senior planner in the BRT project department with Metro Transit here in the Twin Cities. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. So glad we can hear you. And David, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, um, I'm David Francis. I'm a product manager at Remix. I'm working on collaboration. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with Shasna, Adam, and Janice. And after they speak, I'll be demonstrating the newest features around Remix and collaboration improvements with my colleague Janice. Yes, thanks, David. And um, hi, everyone. I am a marketing person here at Remix, um, but I'm actually a plan engineer, so transportation planner and engineer by training. I'm your host today and your introduction to Remix for those who aren't familiar. And for those who aren't familiar, um, you might be asking yourself, who is Remix? So Remix is the first collaborative platform for transportation decision making, and we work with over 340 local governments. Actually, the company just celebrated its sixth birthday. And um, since then, we've maintained a pretty diverse team of transportation and planning practitioners, as well as technologists. And we work with cities and transit agencies to bring together that complete transportation picture through several platforms, the transit planning platforms, street design and mobility management, and they are all underpinned and powered by a unique data analytics platform that we call Explore. And because Remix is so visual, I'm just gonna run through these GIFs really quickly, but this is our tran transit planning platform. It helps agencies design anything as small as a bus detour all the way up to a system redesign while letting people understand the costs and demographic implications of anything they draw. Um, Remix Streets has sort of a same philosophy. It allows you to explore new concept designs with ha without having to resort to something as um, limiting as pen and paper or something as complex complicated as engineering software. And of course, whatever it is that you are designing as a planner or engineer, it is your responsibility to serve people. And so you want to be powered by data so that you know how your plans actually impact humans. So Explore provides a great deal of flexibility and interactivity with spatial data and really democratizes that data-driven decision-making. We at Remix really strongly believe that having the same depth and breadth of information across the team facilitates decision-making for, especially for complex projects. 
So it would not be a Remix webinar if we did not quickly plug Transpo Talk. So for those of you who are in Transpo Talk, awesome. If you are not, uh, go ahead and register at remix.com slash Transpo Talk. The link will be in the chat box. Um, it is a free community for transportation professionals. We have grown to over 625 members, which is crazy. So go there for all sort of that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and um, to some special roundtable events led by experts that we call Transpo talk exclusives and we have a special event coming up december 10th called transpo trivia night um, it's going to be a really fun light-hearted event to sort of round out 2020 so we're dropping the google form there where you can sign up either solo or with a team and this event will be special because you don't actually have to be a member we want you to um, be able to sign up with the team that you want so go for it uh, hope to see you there on december 10th it'll be really fun um, all right, and so I'm just going to segue into Yasna and Adam's presentation. But when you all registered, you were probably uh, confronted with this survey question, what is your favorite collaborative software tool for transportation projects? It got a lot of wisecracking answers. Some folks said, this is a leading question. <laughs> But um, we really did want you to answer honestly, because we figured this is kind of like helpful information for you all to see. I think what really stands out here is that a non-significant number of people said none, which means that um, there's still a lot of unaddressed friction and challenges that when it comes to collaboration. And then for the other category, that's for a bunch of things that were only mentioned once or twice. Um, but of the popular other category, we've got Mira and OneDrive. Those are things I've never heard of before, but feel free to go look up these softwares um, during or after the presentation. My favorite answer is here at the bottom in the other category is a sense of humor. And that's that's true. That's, that's a good one to have as a collaborative tool. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can hear from Yasa and Adam. Um, so both of you guys take it away. Great, thank you. Um, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes. yes? Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, we wanted to talk a bit about collaboration today, um, specifically centered on the planned uh, Metro B line bus rapid transit project. So, this is just to give folks some grounding and background and what these kinds of projects are in the Twin Cities. This is arterial BRT. So, combine, you know, frequent service with consolidated stops. Um, off board fare payment, all door boarding, and then upgraded stations and buses. So you can see here um, the C line, uh, an example of a station bus, which is a similar project that, that opened um, last year. Um, but the B line is a 12.6 mile corridor in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And um, it's you know, kind of meant to be a substantial replacement and improvement upon the region's second highest ridership bus route, but the route that currently has the slowest in service speed. So really trying to focus on those goals of speed and reliability um, when it comes to kind of the, the overall arching goals, transit goals of the project. Um, in terms of, you know, really thinking about the um, interagency coordination aspect of it, it's critical for everything we do. So, you know, Metro Transit is a regional transit agency we don't own any of the roadways that we operate on. And for a project like this, we're between two counties, two cities, divided by the Mississippi River here, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, we've got a segment of road on, uh, that's owned by a state DOT, as well as the number of intersections that, that um, MnDOT is kind of oversees here. So that interagency inter piece is crucial, um, you know, for a project like this and making sure that we are working with local partners, you know, along the planning um, phase of the project through, you know, design, construction, implementation to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So um, our organization to kind of, you know, help um, guide coordination through the planning process has really been through a technical advisory committee made up of representatives from different agencies. So in a moment, um, you'll hear from my um, cohort from Yasna, who's with the city of Minneapolis, but the the TAC has really been tasked with coming up with 
you know, station locations, um, which intersections should we have stops at platform locations, uh, which side of the intersections, near side, far side, um, where exactly should these stops be located, and then starting to look at bus priority treatment. So things like transit signal priority, geometric improvements like bus only lanes, um, and doing some of those um, evaluations across the corridor. Again, you know, back to that kind of speed and reliability goal for the overall project. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Yasna to talk a little bit more about um, the Minneapolis side of this corridor along Lake Street, which is a really important corridor within the city. Great. Uh, thank you, Adam. In terms of city priority, I want to first just provide some brief context about this culturally significant corridor. Uh, the Lake Street corridor on which the B line is situated on and outlined um, here on the slide in red really serves as a major east west thoroughfare in our city of Minneapolis and it also sits parallel to the Midtown Greenway, which is a major path for people walking and biking. So we know that we'll be we'll have to make connections that not just for people walking but biking as well. The corridor runs through various contexts from the very vibrant uptown commercial district on the west to an area populated predominantly by the Latino community, many of who own businesses along this corridor and have brought, brought so much vibrancy and cultural significance. It's also defined, as you can see in the pink areas, as an area of concentrated poverty where 50% or more of the residents are people of color. So we're really dealing with a really uh, widespread breadth of uh, stakeholders along the corridor. Most recently though, the corridor was also a place of widespread civil unrest following the killing of George Floyd at 38th and Chicago, which is located just about a mile south of here, if you can see by that um, black circle there. Really what I, what I wanna showcase here is just the amount of, um, intricacies that really play into this and all of this plays a key role in the approach to this project from the start of how we set forth our priorities by looking at equity and making sure that all of these agencies, the city, Metro Transit and others um, on board are really establishing that as part of the process. Next slide please. So in addition to the cultural context and challenges that the communities along the corridor have faced this year, uh, this corridor really provides a number of other complexities when it comes to local scope coordination. And this is just uh, a list of um, just what some of those entail. For example, Lake Street has long been identified as a high injury street within our Vision Zero Action Plan. So addressing safety is also a key part of this project. Uh, what we did this year, uh, what you can see in the photo, is we did some quick build um, treatments at one of the high crash intersections to test out some of these interventions be before they become permanent and uh, part of this project. Uh, we, there have also been, over the years, several studies led by our counterparts at the county and state DOT, so a lot of really engagement and effort, collaborative effort, went into this already. Um, and also some of the segments of this road are identified in our all in ages and ability network as part of our 10 year transportation action plan, which is going live this week. And so really, how do we provide bicycle facilities along with our BRT route will also play a key role. Um, something else that we're working on in partnership with a different division for Metro Transit is establishing a mob mobility hub at the same intersection of Lake and Chicago. Um, so that's something that will be integrated into the overall BRT schedule. And then on top of all of that, the city alone has 19 program projects in our five-year CIP that need to be coordinated with this project and all those project managers that are leading them. So as you can see, a, there's a lot in terms of coordination. So um, given all of this, I'm going to transition it back to Adam, who's going to talk a little bit more about that process. Great, thanks. Yeah, so obviously, you know, as you can see a lot going on, you know, along this corridor and in this area. Um, and so, you know, I think we've, we've, as we've gone through sort of the beginning of the planning process, we've really kind of, you know, developed a standardized approach to coordination um, that's really kind of focused on these three items. First, you know, just kind of applying a really consistent set of considerations as we um, kind of move through 
the different aspects of planning that I mentioned through through our technical advisory committee process. Um, you know, sharing information for the key project needs. So, you know, both from Metro Transit's perspective, but then, you know, again, from each agency that's that's coming to the table, you know, there are a lot of different priorities and a lot of different requirements kind of that that um, need to be considered throughout um, throughout these decisions. And then really developing tools to evaluate different options for the project and and be able to, you know, look at alternatives, see what makes the most sense and actually, um, you know, get a, get a sense for, for evaluating um, evaluating that and you know in a in a basis that is still firmly within the planning phase of the project rather than you know sort of getting too far down the road into design without um, without having a good feel for what things might look and feel like. Um, so in terms of that first one, you know, as I mentioned, kind of going through and looking at station locations and you know where should you know which intersections should hold should should host stations along the corridor. You know, a lot of these same major bullet points were were looked at, and and this is, I think, represents a lot of those different priorities and goals of each agency. So, you know, not only did we look at some of the more specific items to transit operations and service, but the land use context, what's happening in terms of redevelopment, traffic patterns, what are we looking at in terms of, you know, potential effects on on um, vehicle level of service. What are the right of way constraints and driveways? Um, it's a you know it's a really constrained corridor in a, in a lot of places, and so that was a a um, you know kind of perennial uh, consideration to look at. And then you know knowing that this corridor is on the you know sort of upper end of things when it comes to level of injuries, especially for pedestrians. Um, thinking about pedestrian and bicyclist safety, are we looking at um, are we looking at placing platform locations where there's a marked crosswalk, where there's a signalized intersection? Um, are we thinking about sight lines when we're looking at near side or far side platform locations? Those kinds of things. And then, you know, again, as, as Jasmine noted, lots of different projects going on. So, you know, how can we best coordinate with what those those future projects are going to be? Um, both those that are programmed and then those that might be a little bit further out, but are starting to be kind of thought about and 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 advanced through um, longer term plans uh, with our partner agencies. Um, you know, and then the second big step was really sharing that information for key project needs. And this is, you know, this is one of the ways in which Remix Street kind of came into our process for the B line is being able to say like, okay, you know, this is typically what we're looking for. Um, there are some variations based on the context where we could do with a little bit um, less right of way space, where we could, um, where we might need a larger space for a shelter based on on ridership and boardings and those kinds of considerations. But you know, I think this give this sort of set the basis for okay, this is what we're looking for. This is kind of a, a typical um, sort of dimension that we're going to be. Um, looking at it in different places, and then and then being able to start to see, okay, what would that actually mean for different conceptual platform locations along the corridor? So really, again, developing these tools to be able to really quickly, um, you know, just kind of in house say, okay, well, what if we look at a far side platform here and a near side platform in this direction? What does that look like? You know, what do we end up with in terms of our right of way space and, and those kinds of things and being able to just again work through those those different options um, with our partners and um, you know you know move forward with recommendations for for platform locations so i think that is the extent of um, presentation material that i have so i'll go ahead and stop sharing and pass it back over to janice at this point Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Yasna. So we got a couple of questions roll in from you. Uh, they're both from Daniel Hoyt. So the first one is with BRT changes to the road and intersection, was general purpose traffic slowed? Was that considered acceptable? How did you measure project success? Yeah, that's um, one of the things I would say we're still kind of in the midst of, of learning. Um, certainly, you know, in some, in some cases there are um, you know, some, 
um, some effects that we're looking to work out. Um, but I would say in the vast majority of instances, um, you know, our, our modeling has indicated that really the, the overall growth in traffic is, is bound to be, you know, sort of make the, the bigger impact on general purpose uh, travel times within the corridor. But, you know, I think, again, from our perspective, it's really trying to balance out um, those kinds of goals with what we're bringing to the table and, and finding sort of a happy medium, um, you know, to achieve the goals of the project too. Right. Um, and then that second question is, what incentives slash projects are there to modify land use development to support BRT? Could you read that one again? Yeah, sure. What incentives or projects are there to modify land use development to support BRT? If there aren't any formal projects, I think that's a fair answer. Yeah, I don't know, Yasna, if you can, if you wanted to speak to that. I mean, I know the city has done some really great work with respect to um, eliminating parking minimums, say, and um, in, you know, kind of high priority transit areas, but that's even broader than BRT. That that goes the that goes beyond just something like this, but yeah, I, I think some folks may be familiar with our um, recently adopted Minneapolis 2040 comprehensive plan, which calls for building more density um, and passing some of those zoning laws um, where we go away from single uh, homes to uh, triplexes. So there is, and kind of given the background that I talked about around this corridor of supporting a cultural diversity um, and the fact that a lot of the uh, buildings and businesses were and properties were completely burned down and um, damaged during the summer. I, I think there is really some of that synergy to uh, a lot of money has been raised, I think over 4 million to redevelop this corridor. So that will play in you know, also a key role in how we coordinate the two. And Adam, Adam has been working with some of our folks at the city who do um, uh, property property development reviews whenever there is a new um, development coming along the corridor. So he's very much working in sync with those um, businesses and uh, property owners. Awesome. So we've got a few more questions filtering in, but I also wanted to weave in some questions that I also had for Adam and Yasna that specifically had to do with collaboration challenges and opportunities. The first one I had for you all is, um, you know, since you work for different governing bodies like the county versus the city, for example, people with the county report to the county board of commissioners and city reports to city council. How do you manage different decision makers who have different priorities? Um, I can maybe start with that. Uh, with any project, I also uh, manage our mobility hub program. I'm the city project manager for that, which also requires those are situated near county, state roads or uh, right away. Um, so a lot of it, I would say, has to do with collecting the right data, storytelling, piloting things, um, really showing that maybe if one agency is not comfortable with a certain concept because they haven't tested it before, maybe if this project is a couple of years out, you it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's maybe you know a hundred dollars to put out some bollards and just do a hardened center line or a bump out. So I would say um, just continue to work together to understand where the challenges are and if possible to pilot and collect data and study in the time you have before that project is implemented. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I think um, I, I love hearing when pilot programs are uh, sort of a methodology or a, a tool in the toolkit for folks because I do think that oftentimes a pilot program happens and there's a lot more support for it than people anticipate. Um, okay, let's go back to some of these audience questions. So we've got Drew Hart asking, what were the key metrics your traffic engineers were concerned with? Travel time, queue lengths, and then what thresholds were used? Was there any major pushback? It's a great question. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the big sort of measures of effectiveness that traffic engineers along the corridor have, have been concerned with are, um, you know, really, yeah, queue length is one of them and level of service at an intersection by intersection level. 
Um, you know, one of the things that we like to talk about a lot with projects like this is that because we are moving toward off-board fare payment and all-door boarding, the dwell times are substantially um, lower than our existing local service. Um, combine that with stop consolidation means that you have buses stopping less frequently overall. So in many cases, particularly in a context like this with um, you know, two general purpose travel lanes in each direction, um, the effects just from the project really, you know, are not um, are not so substantial when it comes to um, kind of those those kinds of level of service queue length type um, uh, concerns, particularly in the context of just general traffic growth. If you look over like a period of 20 years, I will say that it's a little bit of a different conversation when you get east of the river for this corridor, um, because many of most of the most of the alignment there is um, is a, a single travel lane in each direction, and we, you know, we we typically um, do plan for in lane stops again to to provide that that transit operation benefit. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly a challenge, and it's certainly a trade off. You know, when you um, when you see you know some some places here and there where um, where something like level of service could be affected. In terms of a hard and fast threshold, you know, I don't know that we've we've really identified sort of a, you know, absolutely this can't happen. We can't go to a level of service E or F or something like that. But um, but in general, it's been more looking at okay, what are the overall effects across the corridor? Yeah, yeah, and and um, and like adding on to the topic of trade offs, we've got another question uh, for from. Sichingi, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and this might be one for Yasna, but are there any anticipated parking loss and how are residents reacting to it? So um, Lake Street, the corridor was reconstructed, I wanna say um, uh, like 10, 15 years ago where some of that happened and um, space was provided to retain some of that parking from the businesses um, and curb bump outs were installed. So, um, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but at this point, we're not, we're kind of using the, what's existing right away to, mm -hmm. um, uh, right now it's a four-way, two-way kind of undiv undivided roadway. So there is a lot of space that we're working with. Um, so I don't, and we haven't really gotten to that point yet of like the actual design. Adam, feel free to add on to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say it varies from, place to place within the corridor. In, in some cases, it is, um, as Yasna said, you know, it's sort of stopping in land like you see here, or like, you know, I, I showed, but in some in some cases, you do have sort of cur either existing curb extensions that would be lengthened to provide a platform um, or potentially new curb extensions that would um, reduce, you know, maybe three to four parking spaces there. In many of those cases, particularly when we're looking at shifting from an existing um, near side stop that the local service is using to a far side in lane stop, um, you know, you could look at basically at balancing it out, you know, so essentially where parking isn't allowed because there's a bus stop there today, you know, you could have parking allowed there in the future, mm. but um, but then you're losing, you know, three or four spaces at a, at the across the street. So um, it's certainly something we'll, you know, we'll be continuing to work through as we get into design. But um, you know, a lot of that does come down to sort of the constrained um, commercial um, district that that we have here, and, and you know, really trying to maximize space for um, for transit users. Mm-hmm. Um, just going to add more to that trade-off topic. Um, you know, parking is a particularly spicy topic, but um, how do you communicate these trade-offs you see when it comes to either parking or constrained right-of-way or curb, curb space? And do you communicate these differently depending on who your audience is? Uh, yeah, I, I can start. So I think, you know, we already have some design regulations that um, 
tell us how things are, where things are going to go and, you know, how wide they need to be and such. So we start from that. Uh, we also communicate early on what those trade-offs will be. Um, I, I think, you know, what has been a, a great tool, and I'm not just saying that because we're on the webinar, is to be able to visualize this. So using Remix to really show here's like how much space we have and, uh, you know, what can go where. But then also I'll just go back to my um, pilot. Also, sometimes uh, like I, at that one intersection I showed, we installed a hardened center lines on a county road. And you know what we hear a lot is, well, there's no way a truck can make that turn with that. So it's like, well, let's try it in that way. Uh, and we, we're saying that it can. So um, yeah, a little bit of everything, visualizing, just communicating those early trade-offs and being transparent about it and just piloting when possible. Um, there's a, another audience question that I love. This is from Joseph Santiago. Um, this is a great question. To the general public, oftentimes the lines are blurred between what agencies command ownership over. What strategies were most effective in relaying information to the general public as a singular voice? How did your agencies approach pushback or opposition to projects? Yeah. Um. That's a really great question. Uh, you know, I think it's it's something that um, comes up with almost every project, and you have to find sort of the right balance between saying, "Oh, that's not our problem. That's you know the county's problem or the city's problem," and saying, "No, you know, we're here as as a group of agencies, you know, putting forward this this plan that." You know, is in this case mostly going to be related to, um, you know, metro transit's work, but but certainly we need to be clear about, okay, you know, especially when it kind of goes back to those trade-offs. Well, we know that we have pedestrian access needs um, that are associated with guidelines and policies that are in place. We know that there are um, certain just travel lane widths that we need to um, need to support um, turn, you know, uh, turning radius. 3DI that um, that we need to be cognizant of. So, you know, I think, you know, again, being clear that this work is being done in an interagency manner that we are that we are working together through this. But then, you know, trying to um, trying also to to find solutions when you know when we're getting questions about something that you know isn't really tied to our um, our agency individually, um, you know, our guidelines. So, you know, good, a great example of this that came up recently was um, an instance in which a shelter was designed and constructed um, closer to a building phase than, um, you know, than, than had been before, or in fact, there wasn't a shelter there before. And now uh, the the width, uh, the the area is too narrow for the business owner's um, snow removal equipment by like, you know, a few inches or something. And so, you know, it's this one of those instances where we need to go back to our our planning and design and say, you know, we um, we don't have a requirement for sidewalk width here. This would be something that would be more um, related to the city or county's requirements, but um, you know, we do have a need for a, an ADA accessible, uh, you know, boarding area for our buses, and, and we know that there are needs for um, certain lane widths. And so, so you know, it's some of those issues that, that definitely do come back up, but I think, again, trying to be a unified voice as much as possible and, and really make it clear that, you know, we've all been participating in the development of these plans, even if, you know, we all are coming to it maybe with different priorities or different guidelines that we need to be following. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of like verbally absolving yourself of any responsibility is not going to help provide that unified front. Right, and it's not gonna help, you know, our relationship with other agencies going forward either. You know, we're all, right. we're all in this together ultimately. And, you know, and I'm, I'm sure the city gets plenty of questions about you know, metro transit facilities and, you know, why there are all these problems with this bus stop, why, why aren't you doing anything about it? And I'm 
I'm sure it's very tempting for them to say <laughs> the same thing. Um, I think, I believe we have a hand raised. Um, Kate, could you uh, maybe unmute the person who raised their hand? This is exciting. We never get a hand raise. Hi, uh, this is, uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Jane Lambrix from the Ithaca Tompkins County Transportation Council in Ithaca, New York. Um, and um, I just wanted uh, to comment a little bit on um, the conversation surrounding park parking and transits, you know, pot potential negative impacts. And I think that I think the conversation needs to be reframed. I, I think because the thing is oftentimes when like, for example, here, whenever we talk about like alternative transportation and parking, there's a lack of framing the conversation in a way that alternative transportation um, it is actually good parking policy. It's taking people that might have been parking there before and transitioning them away to a more efficient form of transportation. There's often this disconnect because we tend to silo um, um, transportation modes. We tend to think of you know bus riders as bus riders. They're they're in their own little silo. We tend to think of drivers as completely separate from that. But the truth is when it comes to a BRT system, for example, you're taking people that would be parking there, thereby reducing the overall, overall capacity that you need for parking. I, I just think that the conversation needs to be framed in that way so we can kind of break down those barriers. And when we talk about, you know, like BRT lanes and stuff, we actually are talking about parking management. And we're also talking about traffic flow. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No. Totally agree. And like you know, one of obviously the, the you know broader goals of a project like this, and you know for our for both of our agencies, if I can speak for both of us, is you know is really you know reimagining a corridor like this as a place that is friendlier to you know non car modes, and it, it's good to be honest about that, and it's good to you know, connect it to our climate goals and connect it to our equity goals and, and certainly dedicating more space for transit users, for pedestrians is all in line with kind of those broader agency goals as well. Yeah, absolutely. If I can just add, I think we're also looking at, um, I, with the many changes that are coming not just to land use and density and um, with our city projected to grow, we really, yeah, we have to kind of go away from that traditional viewpoint. And we're also looking at our curb site now holistically as well and doing some um, internal workshops, but then also we'll be doing a curbside policy that addresses the curb and how do we um, how do we provide access to everyone and not just cars in that traditional sense. So um, I think it's a really exciting time because uh, yeah, there's all these kind of um, yeah, new things that will that will change the uh, trajectory of that. Um, I'm just going to add one thing. Um, one very uh, evocative sort of method I've heard about pitting sort of transit versus parking um, is to add the emotionality in the transit story. So I think when it comes to parking, there's a lot of emotion there. People feel like they have this right and this ownership to that parking space. And so sort of to, um, I guess, compete against that narrative is to also add emotionality to the narrative of transit and transportation improvements. So you can, you know, really frame transit as selling freedom. This is like a great message that I got from Stephen Hunt, who works over at Valley Regional Transit in Boise, Idaho. And if you really sell that story with an emotional narrative, like that, that speaks um, as loudly as the emotional narrative of you're taking away my parking spot. Um, all right, I wanted to, so I, I think we have, we've had a lot of questions from the audience roll in. I'm not sure that we'll be able to answer them all in this webinar, but we'll have another Q&A se session in just a minute. But I wanted to wrap up uh, the presentation portion of this webinar with one more question from me, which is, um, what has worked really well uh, between the city and transit agency partnership thus far? Yeah, I can start with that. And, um, you know, I think kind of going back to the theme of one of the things I had said is that the city and Metro Transit share a lot of broad 
goals in terms of making this corridor uh, more accessible to, you know, to different modes of transportation, particularly more efficient, more sustainable modes of transportation. And so, you know, I think in particular, the idea of supporting pedestrian safety is something that that we at Metro Transit have recognized from a transit planning perspective. Um, so, you know, every, you know, sort of this, this trope that every transit user is a pedestrian at the beginning and the end of their trip, right? So you want to take care of them for, for those, um, you know, those parts of their, their trip as well. And so, you know, this has, I think, really been borne out in our interagency planning process by, you know, like avoiding just having platforms at like mid-block locations where there isn't a, a safe um, crossing or, um, you know, or not, you know, or where there aren't marked crosswalks to, you know, looking at far side platforms where, um, where those sight lines for crossing pedestrians are, are a bit better. So, so again, I think, you know, I think those are, those are good kind of shared goals and help to, you know, sort of help us identify sort of mutually beneficial um, solutions as we start to look at, you know, some of the more nitty gritty details of, of project planning and, and into design. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that, you know, even before we got to this project, you know, between Adam and myself working on this, we already have this 10 year transportation action plan that the city has now, you know, finalized where we included a transit section for the first time um, in the plan's history. And we really started this collaborative where we've been doing it for so long. And now it's um, solidified also in other documents and policies that we can look back to. So there's kind of a this long term partnership um, that, you know, yeah, we can look to that document. Uh, so and, and then what Adam talked about, you know, we have the same goals of equity and safety and climate. Um, so really, it's just, um, yeah, it, it's a partnership that not just happens on this project. And we also have taken, there have been other BRTs that have been built and constructed. And we are, there's a lot of lessons learned from those. So being able to carry those forward and learn from them and apply them to this has also worked really well. Awesome. Thank you, Adam and Yasna. Um, stand by, we might have more questions for you towards the end of the webinar. Um, but before we end, uh, David and I wanted to introduce the newest collaborative tool from Remix, but first we are going to play some role playing. So um, David and I temporarily will not be Remixers. Instead, I will be a transportation planner with the city DOT. Um, temporary street closures for the Slow Streets Network is in my wheelhouse. Unfortunately, it's been very popular by city leadership and businesses alike. And I'm tasked with finding more proposals for Slow Street areas. And I want to collabor collaborate with David. David, who are you? Hey, Janice. Uh, I'm a service planner with the transit agency, and I've become the go-to person for Janice uh, to ask questions about feasibility of street closures. I've also been working on bus consolidation projects. Okay, excellent. So that's who we are for the next couple minutes. Um, so I do have a proposal in mind. I kind of know where I want to put the next slow streets area. And this is probably a familiar workflow for lots of you. It's just an email. So in the body of my email, I'm telling David, I have a question for you. And then in the body itself, I write all the context of where I believe we should have a slow streets area. Um, and then to sort of aid this, this verbalization, I include a screenshot from Google Maps, and then I ask for feedback from David. Um, oftentimes when you collaborate via email, like this is a, this can turn into a long email chain, maybe even a third person gets looped in because David decides, you know, I don't really know this neighborhood that well, so I'm going to ask somebody else in my organization. And then email threads or whatever messaging system you use just gets like really long and unwieldy. And this is a perfect e-card. Um, forward a two week long email thread and hope your team loves to back read from the start to look for details of the issue. I have 100% been there and have gotten very frustrated with how long it takes to retrieve the appropriate context to address the question that my colleague has. And sometimes I have felt like Ron Swanson here when he realizes there's no such thing on um, there's no such thing as privacy when it comes to participating in the internet. 
Um, so don't worry, Reduce Your Frustration Remix commenting is here. Um, so I'm going to uh, do all of this in Remix. So as you all know, Remix is a place where I can draft my plans and also um, do data and analysis. So instead of having to write all of that information in a body of email, I would rather just send this map to David and ask the query um, in a comment and direct him to the comment. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm gonna just say, hey, this is the proposal to start the slow streets network right here um, where we have this no, uh, no go through um, barricade. I'm gonna post this comment. And then what I will like to do is, oops, sorry. What I'm going to do is, um, just copy the link to the comment and send it over to David. And so when he opens up that link, basically he's going to see exactly what I see on the page, which is just all the context of the plan and the comment already opened up. So he can respond to that commenting thread or start that commenting thread right here in Remix. So let's see if he's responded. Oh, looks like I've got one reply. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that reply. And so David has said, hey, inbound buses traveling on the right lane since they're approaching a stop, it will be an unpleasant experience for pedestrians, especially since there is no physical barrier. Okay, good for me to know. So I'm actually going to move this proposal um, just a little bit further down the street. Uh, now that I've had David's feedback there. All right, so that's that sort of internal commenting between colleagues across departments for you. And let's check in and see how, how David's faring. Hello. Um, yeah, so fun collaborating with you, Janice, on that street design. On my side, I have been working on a bus con consolidation project in Remix uh, transit and this is what it looks like so um, I, I've been designing this plan which is about uh, removing a few stops those stops are uh, highlighted with those text annotations I have done my due diligence and now I am ready for public feedback I need to send this to the public and the way to do that is just for me to copy that link um, and I will show you that when you open that link from an incognito window where uh, nobody you know, is logged in as a Remix user, the public will see my design on the map. They will be able to explore details of the map. And they can also comment from here at the top right by sending a, com a public comment. This is the form that will be available for the public. So here I am. I am opening my project for public outreach and I am expecting feedback. Now, back to my uh, logged in view. Oh, I can see that I'm already receiving public feedback uh, like here. Keep parking. I heard we're getting rid of parking here. I can think of why we would, that would be a good idea. Businesses will suffer. Please let me know who I can talk about this. Um, yeah, so Yasna and Adam and uh, folks uh, in the webinar have been talking about such type of feedback. And, and this, is, this is great because I get it in Remix uh, kind of live as it comes. Oh, I can see that I have two more comments here coming in from the, the public folks from the public can identify themselves with a name or email or not. Um, so here it is, basically, uh, you can see from the top, I have a tab for public comments and a tab for internal comments, such as what we were doing previously with Janice between colleagues. Um, at any time, I can also decide to export all of that feedback that I've received into a CSV format which lets me then manipulate the feedback outside of Remix, whichever way I want. Uh, let me quickly show you how that export file looks like. You basically have all the information that comes with the comment, uh, the content, of course, a direct link 
to the comment in Remix, uh, the latitude, longitude, um, and any other information that I need about this. Um, so yeah, this is it. Um, I was able to get some public feedback through Remix commenting. Yeah, so basically in Remix where you have your plans and conduct, an, um, conduct your analysis and collect public feedback, you can also have that continually updating conversation with your teammates in the same place where you do all of that. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, we just wrote a couple blog posts. Um, go check out remix.com slash blog. Um, one of those blog posts David actually wrote, it describes why we have so much conviction to strengthen the collaborative components in the Remix suite. Um, it actually stems from pretty in-depth interviews that we did earlier this year with dozens of our customers. So thank you to all of those who participated in that research back in January and February. All right, <clears throat> so I am going to retrieve a screen share again and show you one more thing. Um, just sort of the cherry on top of the Sunday. So if any of you have attended our August 2020 webinar, it was called the newest communication tools in Remix. We unveiled something called Presentation Studio in Transit. And we are excited to tell you that we've got some new improvements there, some more customization tools. So I'm going to hop into a transit map. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, I just have a, a, a particular hand um, oh, Tiffany Chu raised her hand. Um, do you want to, Kate, can you, can you take care of that? Mm, okay, well, maybe not. So we've got this, this route in Remix Transit and it's the 44 and clearly we've got the, the pre-COVID route, which kind of ran the full length of the 44, this like funny U shape across San Francisco. And then we have the post COVID route, which is truncated. And um, you can tell from this map that it's really kind of hard to distinguish between the two. I could change the colors, but through Presentation Studio, I can do just so much more customization that adds a lot of clarity to this map. So what I plan on doing here is for the pre-COVID route, um, I think I want to change the color to distinguish it. And then I'm going to change the line type to dashed to make it like a little bit less emphasized, along with reducing the line weight. So this really shows you that this, this part of the line is no longer in operations. Um, Again, we can show inbound or outbound. And this time, this is a pretty big update. You can also show different patterns. Um, that's pretty important for um, uh, the operation deta operational details of this route. And um, for the one that is still operating in um, shelter in place times, I think I'm going to accentuate it. Uh, I'm going to keep it blue. And this time, I'm going to make the line weight heavier. This is especially important if you want to sort of delineate between high frequency or low frequency to use those line weight uh, characteristics. And I am going to show the route code along the line. Also great for when you have, you know, if I actually imported the entire SFMT route here, the legend on the left hand side would be just super long. So you might want to get rid of that legend and just rely on route codes only. And I want to show stops this time. Um, we'll just show the time points here. And here we have the ability to show or not show the stop names because it's just time points I'll, I'll keep with the stop names and I can customize what type of stop label I want I want this big boarded circle um, and you can see here I've made further customizations earlier today um, I wanted this because um, the very last on the eastern side of the route where it says P that's sort of like a park and ride so I can right click here and I changed it from that black boarded circle to a P to let people know that that is a special stop. Yeah, so those are some of our newest improvements in Remix Transit. And um, I'm going to go back to our presentation here. I think we have more Q&A left. All right, okay, the question was from Ray Atkinson. Can the public see comments from other citizens and people who created the map? David, you wanna just verbally answer that question for everybody else? Yeah, for sure. Um, the way that it works is that the public does not see any other comments from other citizens. Um, it's only the owner of the map that is logged in with the Remix account that gets to see public comments. Great question. Oh, we've got another question for you, David, from Priya. What use cases have you seen so far with commenting in Remix? 
Yeah, uh, great question. I think, um, you know, we definitely are seeing a lot of interagency collaboration, uh, such as Adam and Yasna for BRT projects, they would comment on their designs, whether it's the right of way designs in streets or the transit um, plan for, for the BRT route um, and using Remix on the map with the geo located comments. Uh, it's really working well for them instead of those emails that uh, Janice has been uh, portraying. So that that's one uh, common one. Public feedback is also definitely uh, used a lot. Um, it's a it's a prominent use case, um, and uh, definitely the last common one is like team colleague um, collaboration through commenting. Um, when we see folks create plans in Remix, many of them will comment their own plans and that other folks from their teams could be able to reply and we see that a lot too cool thank you okay so we're basically out of time for this webinar we have a few more questions left but um maybe adam and yasna would you be open to answering some of these remaining q a's um via email and then we could sort of send out your answers to the to all the registrants would that be cool Okay, quick, great. So there are several questions for you, um, but I just wanted to wrap up. I wanted to thank everybody who attended our webinar and especially thank um, Yasna, Adam, and David for joining this webinar with their wonderful presentations. Um, thank you so much.